Welcome to Stu's Inspirations, episode two. And ladies and gentlemen, today I am joined by what can only, someone that can only be described as a national treasure. Uh, she's an actress, presenter, comedian, and you'll probably best recognize her voice because she's always on our radios. She's often on BBC Radio 2 and more recently on Virgin Radio, it's the one and only Maria McCurlin. Hi, Hello, Maria. Stuart. Hello, my love, how are you? I'm, you know, struggling on this miserable storm Christoph day, been oh, pouring with rain. We've been it? in lockdown since 1953. <laughs> uh, I just don't know what's going on. It's, isn't it just know, the January is hard enough, isn't it, really? Yes. And we don't need all these other things going on. But, um, you know, it is what it is, as everyone says. It is. And do you know, I said to, I was talking to a friend of mine earlier and I said, the other day I woke up and I was really like depressed and I've actually almost started crying and I put something on Facebook about it. I know it's not like me to do that, <laughs> but <laughs> I put something on Facebook about it and someone said, came back and said, actually, today is like the most depressing day of the year, every year. Well, there's Blue Monday, isn't there? That's is that what they call it. it. Was that mm. yesterday? No, day before Blue yesterday. Monday, yes. Today is... Um, Wednesday. C Cerise Tuesday, I think, and then Wed Wednesday. Oh, uh, well, we're on Wed Wednesday and I was on Blue... Uh, red, Red Wednesdays. I, I, I was on Blue Monday for definite and I didn't, I had no idea. So not only have we got COVID to deal with, we've also got the most depressing days of the year. And January. <clears throat> and January. And January, January, January. Generally. And we both obviously live in Hastings, in case anyone didn't know that. And we're, we're very lucky to have the beach, aren't we, and the, the seafront. We are. Beach to walk our dogs and to see that there's a bigger picture out there. Because when you've got one whole sort of, you know, 180 degrees of sea and sky, it sort of suddenly makes you realise that there's a... You know, you're very tiny. Yeah, it really does. Like when that wind's blowing and the and the sea's roaring, and it really, even though it, even on the worst days, it's so refreshing to have that. Mm. I love it. I really love it. We all we often say, I'm always seeing you um, out and about in St Leonard's where we live. Um, you've usually got Dolly with you. How does she get on with the, this sort of weather? She's not, you know, not a big fan of the rain. If you don't see me walking about, you see me cycling with Dolly in the front basket. Her herring around the place, being a danger to motorists everywhere. Um, no, she's tiny, she's a toy poodle and she does not like the rain. And where I live down a little Twitten, it's, um, which means an alleyway, it's an East Sussex word for sort of tiny little alleyway, the sides of a street. I think in the olden days up north, they used to call them the backs. So they the backs them, of the buildings. They call them snickets somewhere. In some snickets, I don't snicket. know that one. Lemony snickets. Lemony snickets. Um, so down the Twitter, and I've got a, my own wind tunnel, darling. So Dolly quite often gets lifted off her very legs. She's, no, she's, got, so quite, she's got quite good at, you know, wind surfing without anything touching the ground. <laughs> she's so funny because when I've been around to your house and having her in the salon, she's so she's a different dog like when she's at the salon she's a bit shy she's a little bit nervous she's a little bit like oh hi uncle Stu or hi auntie julie um but when you at your house or down your twitten she's a monster she's like that you get away from my house <laughs> really, <laughs> this is my patch yeah she's really protective isn't she yeah yeah it's ridiculous really for one so tiny she, and she does it with all sorts of dogs which is foolhardy in my book to do it yeah. with a great big doberman <laughs> not a good idea not a no. good look dolly to be torn asunder so when you started riding your bike with her in your basket how did she get on with that was that like an instant oh, i can do well, this from just... when she was a puppy because i had one before that used to do that so i just thought look you know everything really you do with this uh, a dog the, the earlier you get them used to it, i.e. keeping them in the kitchen, fail. Uh, not having them in the bedroom, fail. Not having <laughs> them on your bed, fail. fail. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I'm very aware of this thing now. So I put her in the basket from, you know, early. And she doesn't need to clip on her collar. She just very happy puts a little paw outside the basket Oh looked God. around and you know I was living in London then so we were doing quite a lot of that in London with big buses and traffic and so on but 
she's fine. It's her little safe place almost. Little does she know she has to have trust in me and really I'm not to be trusted. <laughs> Well, no, she's so cute and she really does have complete trust in you. I, mean, I, I find it. Um, can you try, imagine me trying to get Ralph in the front basket? Well, Ralph is about 19 stone and about seven foot high. So I think you're better off putting him on wheels, basically. Would, Just get four would. little wheels and put on casters and get Dr. <laughs> Noel Fitzpatrick to do it for you. The super vet. I think he'd, I think Ralph would be like, yeah, I'll give it a try. I think he'd, he said, yeah, I can probably get in there, no problem. He tries Or to maybe you could have a little trailer, Stuart. I think maybe a trailer that, you know, the prongs just go on your back wheel yeah. and then you could put all your dogs and you could be the maddest man in St. Leonard's. Well, not the maddest, come on. I'm never going to be the maddest. <laughs> Very <am I>? close. <laughs> uh, the no, most there is eccentric. someone. There is someone in my London salon, there's someone that comes there and he's got, um, I think he's got a boxer that sits in a trailer that he, that he pushes along on his bike. It's, yeah. front, though. it's amazing. I see a lot of people with um, shopping trolleys with their dogs poking out the top or little prams and push chairs. And I always think, oh no, that's terrible. You know, I always think they probably have dolls in there as well, but it will be me soon. <laughs> well, there is one, actually, one. there is one client. She's gorgeous. Her name's Sandra. She won't mind, mind me mentioning her. But she does um, lots on Instagram and she's got little dolls. And wherever she goes, she gets her Barbies out of her bag and puts the Barbies in front of the sign of wherever she is and takes photos. Yeah. We've all got to get through this, Stuart. I'm, I'm got... not here to judge others because, listen... I'm as nutty as they come. Lockdown has just made us do very, very, you know, crazy yeah. things just to get by. I've still, I'm just sitting at my, looking at my Christmas tree, which is still up. <laughs> I can't believe it's got shiny up. baubles on and lights. Why would I take it down in these dark times? It does make mm -hmm. you happy. I, in fact, I walk around the streets of St Leonard's and see a, a lot of uh, people have still got Christmas decorations up. It's not just you. Well, you can keep them up officially till Candlemas, which is the 2nd of February. That's the 40 days of Christmas. Useless fact for you there. You're making it up. I'm not. I'm not. The 12 days of Christmas is relatively new in comparison. You used to keep up because there's lots of feast days. I can go into it. There's lots of feast days in January, which people also celebrated. So while there were different feast days to celebrate, I think in very Catholic countries, especially South America and Spain, etc., they would keep them up and they would have the festivals of St. Stephen and whatever and whatever. There's mm. about six different, I can't, don't ask me to name them, different festivals during January. I'm boring myself. You should do this on Mastermind. This could be your specialist. I've done Mastermind. This could be your specialist subject. Celebrity Mastermind. And well, what, was your, what, what was your specialist subject when you were on it? Um, it was one of the Mitfords. It was Unity Mitford. Um, I like the Mitfords very much. The writers, Mitford sisters. One was a fascist. One was in love with Hitler. One was quite a socialist. One was a writer. And I thought I'd do Unity because she died at 33. Oh, so no, my short was, life. Short there life. There's so much research to be done. But, you know, an extraordinary life. Wow. And um, I came second. I was annoyed. Who beat you? Uh, I think a man from Horrible Histories, the right, one oh. of the writers from Horrible Histories. Well, I bet it was on history. It's unfair. It's his job. Uh, well, I mean, you know, it's all, basically, the, you do your specialist subject and the little boy from, oh, Outnumbered was on and he's, his specialist subject was uh, something like absolutely fabulous. And he'd just spent the previous two weeks watching every episode of Absolutely Fabulous back to back again and again. And uh, <laughs> so he got well, did really do. well in his specialist round. But then when it came to the general knowledge, which is yeah. one that messes you up, of course, you know, uh, what Humpty Dumpty sat on or what? He went, I don't know, chair? Whoa, bless him! <laughs> well, I suppose if you don't know, you don't know. I'm always saying that to people. If, you, if, you're, if I'm watching I'm a Celebrity, you either know it or you don't. Not I'm a Celebrity. What's it called? University Challenge? No. <laughs> No, I'm definitely, I can't get, Only ever, if I get one right on University Challenge, it's a miracle. Um, I was thinking of who wants to be a millionaire? Oh, yes. You either know or you don't, Maria. Yeah. That's it. So when you go and do these shows, like when you go up to the studios and, and you're on Master, Celebrity Mastermind, do you take Dolly? 
Uh, I didn't take Dolly for Mastermind. I do take it. I did take it to the BBC. It was ten years I was at the BBC on Radio Two. I know with it was Graham Norton. It was such a well, it is such a brilliant show, and and like I said, your voice is so recognisable straight away. Everyone knows it. Well, see, they used to know it from Euro Trash. I know. I love it. I loved Euro Trash. Um, I still clearly, do, my, really. I've got a face for radio. <laughs> no, 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 no. voiceovers. Um, but uh, as yet, I haven't been up to the Virgin Studios, which are on the 10th floor, right, ne- uh, 17th floor, right next to the Shard, with beautiful views of London, because we've been in lockdown. And because I had a, an appendix thing before Christmas, um, I'm kind of seen as slightly vulnerable. My immune system is a little bit shot. So I'm recording from home. They sent me all the kit. Oh, did and that? I have to... Yeah, and I have to get onto, you know, Simrex 11, the IPDTL line. And I'm really, you know what I'm like with technology. I can barely do a Zoom. <laughs> so, so I sit there with my big mic and my headphones on. Oh, good for you. I haven't heard it yet, actually. I've been so busy bloody working. But I shall tune in this weekend. I did know that but you're, you're not working now. at the moment. Oh, no, I am. Because I've got the rumour spotlight as well. And I've got my websites and everything else. So it's all... And also, because the whole... We're, where we're not working at the moment, we have to try and change everyone's appointments. That's a job in itself. Yeah. Oh, if you're booked up for the whole month. Do you have like, any idea when you're allowed to be open again? Well, we're going to open again uh, on the 2nd, which is a Tuesday. The 2nd Feb- of Feb. 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 Yep. Uh, and we're just going to do, I'm just going to do, because it says in the guidelines that we ha- we're allowed to do welfare grooms. But what a welfare groom is, is really foggy like some people think it's if a dog's matted already some people think that it's uh ju- you know you shouldn't do anything at all unless it's got a vet letter um personally i think that welfare is a uh, regular grooming for dogs that need grooming like a poodle for example yeah. has ha- their hair bearing so their hair grows and grows and grows just like ours does and if we don't brush it then it gets knotty and matted. But me, why did you, I mean, you were open until the, open until uh, tier four. Well, we were allowed to open then. They changed it about two weeks, about a week ago. Oh, did they change it? Yeah, they, well, they said we were essential and they agreed with the, all this. And then they said only for welfare and, um, and- Service dogs. And people with a vet letter. So for me, it's, it seems so silly because we, we spend all our times like lecturing our owners saying, brush your dog, brush your dog, don't let it get matted, don't let it get matted. And now we're saying, oh, just let it get matted. And if once it's matted, we can groom it. It seems to be like locking the stable door after the horse is bolted. And so for me, welfare is grooming on a regular basis if that dog needs it. And especially like also puppies, for example, if they've never <laughs> been socialized with a, or got used to a salon, Hello, Dolly. Hello, big girl. Oh, what a beautiful face. If they've not been socialised with the salon, then they, you know, we have to set them up to have a nice life. And if every six weeks... So if you ask your owners to let it get matted, then basically you're making your job quite hard for yourselves. Well, it just means that we're we're sort of tying our hands. Who's going to come and check to see if this dog is matted or not? I mean, I know that we need a tighter lockdown, etc., but you were not letting people into the salon. You were passing a dog backwards and forwards. Unless these dogs are, you know, uh, super spreaders, I, I can't see what the problem is. Yeah, I mean, we had so many things in place to make sure that, that our, we were safe, the staff were safe, the dogs were safe, and the owners were safe. But even so, it seems that, you know, they're, they're trying to stop anyone from get, coming out of their house, which is absolutely, I totally understand it, but it shouldn't be in the detriment of the dog's welfare. Yeah. It it does seem ludicrous that we're not open. But you've been doing other things. You've been singing and doing things like that, haven't you? Well, I've been doing bits and bobs. You know, I've always got my hand. I've got, you know, I'm part of the, we called ourselves the Barbarella Fellas initially. But um, now we're called the the, uh, Fabulous Barker Boys. Oh, what's wrong with Barbarella Fellas? I love that. We could be either. Uh, we started the the fabulous. Well, I see Barker the boys. fabulous Baker Boys. Yes, you, it's a pun on that. But um, yeah, somehow just, Barbarella fellas rolls well in the mouth, as it were. Yeah. And I'm sure you all do too. We do, well, we're, we're very funny. It's very, it's such a good little group. And you know, we've gone to Norway with it, and we've gone all over the, you know, all over the country. We were on that TV show, Sally Forever. Do you remember Sally Forever? Yes. It was with um, 
Julia Davis wrote it. Uh, and on the very first episode, it starts and it's the four of us doing... I think I saw it, yes. And you were in a nightclub or something, yes? Yeah, well, in a the- it was a theatre. And theater, he, sorry, her sorry. sort of loving... I don't want to downgrade you, darling, from a theatre to a nightclub. Well, no, it was, a, it was like a community centre. Right, 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 so right, right. I think, you know, to be fair, you gave us an upgrade, if anything. Um, it was the lead guy, whose name I can't remember, but he's done loads of stuff. Uh, he's almost like the, the male version of you. <laughs> he does lots of comedy, acting. Anyway, I can't remember his name. Mark something? Anyway, he wanted to be... His hobby is being in the, a barbershop quartet, and that's where we came into it. So, oh. yeah, I've been doing quite a bit with those boys. And, in fact, we did, a, we did the theme tune to this podcast together, and then I had to cut all the other boys out because we couldn't get it to sync properly because we're in stupid lockdown. So I had to sing. So you did them all? I did them all. <laughs> Basically, you're desperately trying to go solo. You're Gary Barlow. I'm not Gary. No, it was Robbie that did that. No, it's Gary Robbie. Barlow, though, writes all the songs, doesn't he? Oh, and he's true. in control of it all. He's the one that earns the big money by writing all the songs. That is true. That's very true. Yeah, maybe I am the Gary, but we've got the same hair. <laughs> he's 50 today, Gary Barlow. No, oh, he's a bit older than me. Thank God. Not much older than me, but a little bit. Is that you pinging or me? It's me. I can't, like, every time I put anything on, it's just everything pings. It's so annoying, isn't it? Sorry. Sorry if you're listening. Turn your ping off. I don't know how to do that. How do you turn it off? It's an email. Just turn it on the side there. Even I know how to do that. I'm on a computer. Oh, I see. No idea. Absolutely no idea. See, imagine if I had to set all your stuff up for Virgin Radio. I wouldn't have a clue. I know, I was sweating, like, you know, the whole thing was just a big trauma for me. Anything to do with technology, if I can't do it, just makes me, takes me back to when I was sitting, you know, my O-levels. Well, that's what happened to us yesterday, because I was supposed, we were supposed to be re- recording this podcast yesterday, and I've got all this kit that I bought on the internet. None of it works. What is it called, this kit? Is it called Zoom's Made Easy, or is no, it called, called Podcast Your Way Out of Depression? I can't remember now, it's up there somewhere. Anyway, it's hidden away in the back of a cupboard now because I'm never going to use it again. So how did you manage to get... Oh, oh you haven't actually set it up. No, because it won't work. The speakers won't work. So I'm having to use my trusty blue microphone. Blue. Right. And did the helpline not call you back? No. And they were supposed to either email me or call me back and they didn't. So it's not very get good. Get it out it? on Twitter. Get it out on Twitter, darling. I will. What's it called? I should say what it's called now because, you know, millions of people are going to be listening to this. <laughs> Uh, How so many when people you, do you have listening? Oh, a good four. <laughs> Your <laughs> mum. <solid> <laughs> yeah. My mum, James, oh, Ralph, my poodle. Yes. Uh, she, and Molly might listen in the background. She's my bee Uh So when you went to the studios at the BBC, you said you took Dolly with you. Yes, I had to get her, um, I had to get her risk assessed. So you I had a, laminate, a laminated form so that she wouldn't, um, you know, bite anyone, bring disease into the building, uh, <laughs> do any of her business. I mean, how, how you can guarantee that, I don't know. Did, she ever, did she ever do she, any of the business? She normally used to sit on my lap in the studio, but then once she was bounding around in the studio and um, they'd set up for S Club 7, do I mean, or somebody like that. Well, I hope so. Um, Love it's set up for them to come in and then the sound engineer said I think she's bitten through a cable <laughs> so when they got to reach for the stars went a bit <laughs> no I love it so um and then once somebody did a poo in Johnny Walker's studio Everyone's and it wasn't Dolly. Sarah Cox takes her dogs in as well. She's well, got a dog. you going to say Sarah Cox did it? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> She's it fully wasn't Dolly, but Sarah Cox. Sarah Cox is fully house trained and a lovely woman. But her dogs go in as well. So it was annoying that I should get the blame. But Johnny Walker sent me an email saying, look, I'm a dog lover, but, you know, enough is enough. And I was thinking, look, I'm going to have this poo DNA'd so that I can prove it's not Dolly. But I didn't because I thought, no, be the bigger person, take it on the chin. Not, not literally, obviously, no. take the poo on the chin. <laughs> um, so that's the BBC for you. Oh, I'm really but, disappointed in Johnny Walker. Come on. What are you? Oh, I'm very I'm disappointed. I'm sorry to light in on the magic. Oh, God, no, there's, trust me. Oh, there was never any magic. I'm never going to go there that far. <laughs> but 
I just always get really surprised when people are a bit funny about things that dogs do. Because <laughs> I always think... Well, I suppose, uh, fair enough. I mean, you know, he does uh, use that studio and you don't want to be sitting in a studio with a poo. But then Steve Wright, on the other hand, I'm giving away all the... <laughs> the secrets. He often used to take his, pull his own teeth out, or maybe he's got a an aversion to the dentist. I don't know. He's a he's a lovely man, Steve Wright. But so uh, he would or have tooth pain, and he would constantly gargle with um, TCP, and then spit it into the bin, or put it on tissue and put that in the bin. So any studio he's been in you just know that it's the TCP studio. It's oh, yeah. Steve oh, Wright's been in here. This is horrifying. Like, I'm literally like, it's like a horror film. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, well, is it, and do you think that Virgin's going to be like this? I think Virgin is a little more, um, you know, it's a relatively new company. I mean, the BBC, those studios have been going forever and ever are men. It's in Wogan House, uh, where the great man himself used to record his show. And, you know, it's quite sort of old fashioned. You know, it, every Christmas, it's the same decorations that go up. And it's a bit like um, a community center for old people. You know, there's t tinsel. Who uses tinsel anymore? Nobody. <laughs> what about those paper chains? Do you remember the paper chains that you used paper to have chains. The end? It's all a bit tragic. Whoever does the Christmas decorations, <laughs> you know, hasn't been, hasn't watched the design programs. That's all I will say. I did a podcast interview at The Spectator once, and I, that's how I imagine it to be similar. That's been yeah, it's kind of a bit crusty. Yeah. And, you know, people think if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But it's also very much like W1A. You know, there will be 93 emails that go round and memos and meetings about meetings. <laughs> and in the new BBC, it's all little pods that you sit in for your meetings about meetings. Um, and nothing ever gets decided because nobody is prepared new, to make yeah. a decision. And so did, when you got in touch with Virgin and all that contract all happened, did you mention Dolly? Yeah, I think because it's um, a news building, I think they've got a dog band there, actually. Oh, I love which, that. Yeah, obvious, no, a dog ban. Oh, what a dog, dog? ban. I what thought, did you think I said? I, I wasn't sure. What the, I, I thought because lots of these new companies that are amazing yeah. have got like areas that are just like play areas for dogs. Like we yeah. went to, where did we go? Me and Julie were doing something for the Groomer Spotlight. We went to this amazing company in Holborn and the whole building was literally built for people to bring their dogs to work with them. How lovely. So I, that's how I imagine Virgin to be because you think, you know, it's, forward thinking and you know well it's a lot it's the whole kind of times radio is there and talk talk radio used to be there wow. i remember i did actually smuggle her in once when i did uh, matthew matthew matthew's rights show hmm. on talk radio and it was fine but anyway we'll cross that bridge when we come to it i mean Absolutely. you know hope i hopefully lockdown will be over soon and i'll be able to find out and you've got quite a good support network down here anyway so you've got people that look after dolly if you can't be there don't you so what how does that work a support network <laughs> oh yeah i mean how does it work you've got friends is it family or who looks after dolly oh well my friend who i share the beach hut with emma she normally has dolly for any overnight so when i was in hospital for an unexpected hospital dash for four days she had dolly for four days and would just send me pictures while i was in hospital bed to cheer me up <laughs> oh, that's, that's lovely. That's a good friend. And it's so funny, yeah. whenever I come down or walk down, in the, especially in the summer, I walk down past your beach hut, there you are, sitting with a glass, glass of Prosecco or champagne. Yeah, Prosecco Row, they call it. Lovely. Uh, <laughs> because it is. Um, but, you know, we long for those days. At least when we had lockdown before, it was coming into the summer, wasn't it? I mean, we had March and then it was quite a nice April. But being enclosed inside... You wouldn't want to really be outside at the moment though because no. it's so horrid although i'm doing a lot of running i find I'm are fine. you I'm doing a lot of running yeah these outside days. outside <laughs> yes rather than just around my house yeah me and no, my i thought maybe you had a running machine like i've got a cross trainer oh, no. i'm demonstrating it for you i can see <laughs> <laughs> no i me and my friend steve do a, do a good 5k or 6k about three times a week very good impressed with me how long does this 5k take you? 30 minutes. 
excellent. It's not bad. I'd love to, I'm trying to get my times down a bit because I've got a friend, Melanie, who's an actress as well. And she really sadly lost a child a few years ago um, to a really rare form of cancer. And she's, her and her husband are just the nicest people ever. And so whenever they've got um, the charity, which is set up in his name, and they do lots of benefits, etc. And they've decided to do the Cardiff Half Marathon. And they've asked me to take. <laughs> so that's 13 miles, yeah? 13 miles and I'm doing 5K. So I just thought to my, it was supposed to be in March. And so I thought, oh God, I'm gonna have to really get training because I've got to get myself, my stamina up. You can't just not just try it, do you know what I mean? So I started doing it and it's really hard. My knees, I'm too hard. I'm like, when you get to sort of mid forties. Well, the thing is with the half marathon, or even the full marathon, you don't have to go hell for leather. You can do it in a, you know, a long time and hobble around. Look, people do it wearing diving bells, you know, but you want to do it like a runner. You want to be Mo Farah, but I'm look. Gonna I, I'm going to win. <laughs> so, well, you better move your ass from 5K then. That's all I have to say to you. Right. Well, the thing is, is that I am actually really enjoying it now. And even though the weather's been dreadful, just like we were saying earlier, running along that seafront, it's so nice. I just really refreshes it's really cold for the first five minutes and I'm always saying to my friend Steve I'm freezing I'm freezing and then suddenly it's gone because boiling you, yeah I'm but what about I would say if you've got bad knees uh, run on grass that's true there's no grass on the seafront no but you there's some lovely lovely you could run up the hill to the to the that's fire hill what you've said there and what you've just said there is exactly why I don't, because I live at the top of Silver Hill, which, and there's a beautiful park. I live right at the top of Alexandra Park and it's gorgeous, but it's so hilly. I can't, I wouldn't, <laughs> I'd never be running it. It's hard enough to walk up it. <laughs> well, <laughs> walk, walk up the hill and then do a bit of running, you know, do that training. Yeah, that's what I should do. I've, I've said to Steve the other day, we've got to do in intervals because when I started the 5K or the 6K, the longest that's I've done- That's what you do. Yeah, you started small and then built up and now I can just run it, but it, it is quite- How long does it take to build up to 5K when I you do think, couch to 5K? It didn't take long. Literally, it didn't take very long. Two weeks? Um. Yeah, I'd say about two weeks. If you're going three times a week, on the second, the end of second week, you should be able to do it, I'd say. I, well, I don't know for definite. I'm not, no, like, personal Joe training. Wicks. You're not Joe Wicks. No, I know that you wouldn't think that to look at me, because... No, it's just that, you know, knowing good. about it all, he if probably long knows hair. how long... What? If I had long hair, I could do Joe Wicks. You could wig it, darling. <laughs> I could wig it. That's exactly right. So, changing the subject, Maria... And thinking back to dogs, did you grow up with, grow up, I can't speak, did you grow up with dogs? No, I didn't. My mum hated dogs and was very frightened of them. So we were all frightened of them. And then when we used to come home from church, if there was a dog, we all used to have to stand still like statues. So we grew up petrified and I didn't have my first dog um, until about 15 years ago. Really? And I had um, a little Maltese Terrier. I just got it on a whim. It was a bit runty and quite thick now in comparison. I didn't know what to compare it to, but very sweet and a lovely little companion. And sadly, he had a heart condition, so died at 10. Oh. And I'd done the Joe Good barking hour, which she does on Radio London. And I'd talked about the fact that my dog had a heart condition and was not really going to last very much longer. And all her listeners um, who all have, you know, love dogs and had yeah. dogs, hence the barking hour, rang in and said, you must get another one now, you must get another one now. It will help the older one cope and make give it a bit of new lease of life. And it will train the younger one and it will help you when the little Maltese dies, called Puppy, very inventive name. Um, and so my friend looked up some puppies and found Dolly and I, Got her three weeks, I think. I had two dogs for three weeks and then oh. poor little puppy died. Oh, that's really sad. Poor puppy, the adult. Yeah. Poor puppy. Well, I say died, was very, very poorly. And you, you know that thing when people you say, oh, they will tell you when it's time. And you think, well, how? They don't speak. But they sort of do. 
yeah, they, they do. do. Unfortunately, um, and it's awful because you, like you say, everyone thinks that it's never going to happen, but actually they do. And, and the kindest thing and the most loving thing that you can do is to acknowledge that and not put it in a push chair and push chair it around when it can't wee or poo or eat or do anything. Um, that's not really a life. So, you know, he couldn't breathe and was really suffering. So I just took him to the vet and it was wonderful. I mean, it takes about 30 seconds. I, I said to the vet, can I book myself in for a week on Tuesday? <laughs> you know, because we're we're kind. We can do that to dogs and cats and other creatures. Isn't it weird, isn't it weird that we don't do it to like? I know that it's an awful thing to say we don't do it to humans, but you know, you have to go to Switzerland to get all that sort of stuff done, and it's such a, a horrible old industrial estate in Switzerland that's like a kind of you know caravan park. Yeah, what is wrong with us? I always thought that by the time that I want to go, <laughs> it's my it's getting sooner by the hour. Um, <laughs> That you'll be able to go into Tesco's and do five illnesses or fewer, <laughs> and then uh, you go back to a back room and pay with your club points, yeah. and so you just you know get your shopping, <laughs> so for your last meal, wait in the little back room, get the lethal injection, and then they put you in a shoot and Tesco's do the funeral. That's fabulous. Yeah, the Tesco funeral. It could be a package deal. So did you get? Um puppy cremate like did, did the vet do all that sort of stuff for you no I took puppy home in fact I had a rather nice box and before I went to the vets I just popped because somebody came around my friend Tony came around and dug Tony from the harbour and nurseries dug a little hole in the garden um and I wanted to see if puppy would fit Aww. so I put him in before not telling him that you'll be in this later oh well, this is awful <laughs> I know. And I took a photograph. Oh, God, we don't want to see that. No, no, no. Really it's not, no, I mean, he, you know, he looked fine. He just didn't, didn't look like a well dog. No. Um, and then I brought him home in a sort of antique tablecloth that I'd taken for that very purpose. Isn't it fun? And I, I buried good. him in the garden oh. and I pl planted a bay tree and then I sold the flat. Ah. <laughs> oh. Um, not, you know, the delivery, but I, pa I pass the bay tree constantly and it's absolutely enormous and it gives me great pleasure. Oh, well, that's lovely because you still go past it and it's about the memories, isn't it? Because he's in there, he's in your heart. Little pup, yeah. I think, definitely. And so does uh, Dolly get on with other dogs generally then? Yes, she's very curious and likes other dogs and is constantly licking them. Oh, she's so lovely. She's such a sweetheart. Whenever she comes to the salon, because Ralph is, as you know, humongous and she's tiny weeny. He's a standard good. poodle versus the toy poodle. You, you yeah. can't really understand that they're the same breed. No, but they're both very clever. Yes. You could see them sitting at a table playing chess. <laughs> I think. Yes. <laughs> the woofy gambit. Yeah, yeah, gambit. That. that's a good idea. So what? Um, what's next for you then? Are you off to the studio soon or when are you able to go back? Well, I think when we lock down, when we leave lockdown, whatever happens first, or I get a vaccine or whatever. Um, but I'm trying to use this time to write. Um, so I'm sort of doing a, not so much a memoir, more a kind of series of essays, comedy sort of essays of various points in life. Mm, um, that's really fun. And that's been going quite well, but the, this last week I just kind of, you know, I've been like Jack Nicholson in The Shining, just writing the same sentence again and again and again. Do you ever, do um, you ever find yourself finding it hard to get like inspired to do that sort of stuff then? Like to motivate yourself to actually get up and do it? Um, yes, but the, the, as they say, you know, don't get it right, get it writ, because you can correct something that's on the page or on your computer. But if it's a blank page, there's nothing to correct. So, you good. know, I'm trying not to edit myself too much as I go. Sometimes I write it and I think, oh, that's a load of rubbish, but I'll leave it. And then I come back to it and I think it is rubbish, but I'll make it less rubbish by doing this or doing that or cutting this bit. So, you know, we all censor ourselves and have kind of low self-esteem about, about what's possible. Um, and I've been enjoying it when I can, you know, make myself do it. But as every writer knows, you have the cleanest drawers because you think I'll just clean the drawers out before or 
I'll sort my wardrobe out. I'll do winter and summer clothes, or I must just wash the kitchen floor, you know, anything rather than sit down and write. But once you get into it, uh, is it like it's... something you get into it and then you're there for hours and you can't put it away because you've just got it, it's all flowing? And then... No, I think your concentration goes after a while. So I think four hours is about my maximum. Well, and might... I try, you know, if I can do a thousand words in that, no, maybe 1500 words in that time. But then the following day I edit. Right. So I'll, I'll ed, you know, because when you, you don't, you miss words. So you come back and have a look at it and take bits out or realise that you've said, because four times in one paragraph, you know, because, things like because, that. Because, 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 because. Yes, so, exactly. So just, do you, wait, does your publisher give you a time limit or do you work for your own page? Well, no, because I, um, it was just before lockdown happened. So I said, look, in the beginning of lockdown, I was too anxious to do it. So I said, don't give me a deadline because I don't know if I'll be able to do it at all. But this second time round and, you know, not having the sun, um, and ex outside walks and so on. I've been a bit more disciplined. Well, that's really good. So it's going to be a book or is it going to be a series of books? No, 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 no. It's going to be a book. Just a, um, a book that you're hoping to be out. So I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to it. How exciting. And so when you go, um, will there be aspects of your um, agony aunting in it? Well, I haven't got to that yet. It's more sort of like I was starting to, to do it as a, in a linear way, you know, from my life. But then I just thought, oh, that's boring. I'll just do little gobbits of my life, things that happened in my life that have had a um, and made an impression on me or had a profound whatever. So, you know, probably about 4,000 words each chapter. Um, you know, there might be kind of... 12 chapters or oh fun. I don't know. it's gonna be fun 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 well i'm i'm not even halfway there yet so don't hold your breath <laughs> I, 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 I got asked to write a book about dogs and i told them <laughs> i told them what ideas i had because i really wanted to do i still do want to do um history of grooming through the years so from the big turn of the century and up to now because it's so it's changed so much because with the introduction of, uh, introduction of electricity and just all sorts of different things and how they used to cut the dog's hair with these little manual weird things, not just scissors. <laughs> and does anybody want to, you to do that book? Well, she, I, I sent off the brief and she didn't ever get back to me, so no. <laughs> oh. But, you know, I should chase her. I'll, maybe I'll just write it anywhere and then anyway and send it to a few publishers. So going back to COVID, are we in a better mindset now this time? And how do we feel about the, the uh, vaccination? Well, I think that's, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I think it's quite important that we get both vaccinations. I think government saying that, you know, we vaccinated 4 million people. Well, technically you've actually given them the first vaccine and you need two. Uh, so, I think as long as we can keep the supply chain coming, I'm really, you know, willing them and fingers crossed for them not to feck this up. Uh, Didn't they say today though that there's a, some problem with the supply chain? I, I yeah. can't. Even well, them. you know, they need to focus on some fun stuff rather than. It's very, very important that they keep this rollout coming yes. rather than you know the first few weeks. Yes, we've done four million people and then stop because we are at a very critical stage. I'm not a big fan of this government and the way they've handled it, I'm afraid. Me either, I'm with you 100%. I but wonder... I think we're, we're just all a bit worn down by it now. It wasn't so bad in the summer. It had a, a brief lull in the summer. We were still under three feet away and no public gatherings, three feet, two meters away, sorry. That's the size of Richard Osman or Peter Crouch, <laughs> as I keep telling people in shops. <laughs> um, and uh, masks and so on but it didn't feel quite so bad in summer now it feels like ah oh, this still is going on yeah it really does it's really but if you'd have said to me last february by next february a hundred thousand people will have died yeah no i know it's, it's horrendous it's terrifying our, our figures are horrendous up the um 
the population of Hastings and St Leonard's yesterday and it's 94,000. Oh, I thought it was about 68,000, so it's more. Yeah, it's more, but it made me go, well, that's the whole of our sort of home town. Yeah, if obliterated. You, yeah, it's absolutely terrifying. It really, And it makes me wonder as well, just to, to be a little bit political for a second, I don't know, because the very start of this, I remember them saying that um, that they were looking for herd immunity and that they thought that that might be the way out of it. And I don't think they've wavered. I think that possibly what they're doing is waiting for it, for every, all these people to get it and then for it to tip the balance and we're all going to get herd immunity anyway. And they can save the money of these vaccines because we'll all be immune anyway. <laughs> it just Well, it's, you know, this government has been very hard to second guess, but they've fucked up quite a lot of it haven't they really from the from the you know, world beating track and trace system that cost something like 22 billion oh. um and then dido harding who was in charge of it has gone on six month leave leave so she can't be tracked or traced uh really? it, it seems is she really on six month leave yeah so that really has never worked properly, the world beating element. I had somebody, a friend of mine who was indoors for two weeks and never saw a single person. No one came to the door, two weeks, two weeks, and was beeped. You, do, you have been no near somebody who has... Uh... That's and then another friend who had COVID was hospitalized, put on a ventilator. Um, and while she was on a ventilator, it said beep, you have been near somebody who has COVID. No, that's unbelievable. That's disgusting. So that hasn't worked. The PPE never got there on time. Really everything they've tried to do. I know that I, I'm fully aware when people say don't bash the Tories or it's, that this is a pandemic and no one's ever had to deal with it before. But it just does seem to be that everybody who's been awarded the contract is either a Tory donor or, you know, a friend of Matt Hancock's he met down the pub. I just can't Let's not get political, though. No, let's not get political. But I do have to say this one thing is that every single person I know is was saying before we lock down, we need to lock down. We need to lock down. There was a whole, we need to really lock down. We should have locked down two weeks ago. We should definitely lock down. And then Scotland does it. And then it's like Boris Johnson goes, oh, we should probably lock down. <laughs> we probably We've lock been down. about two or three weeks behind virtually every time a major decision has been made sure and that's quite a few lives and to lock down before Christmas like three days before Christmas when people had made plans um a lot of people went through with those plans and we're seeing the results now yeah, yeah. 50 1600 deaths yesterday I know it's just absolutely terrifying and my poor mum she's on her own in Eastbourne and has I she know had her jab no and the weird thing is is this well she's she's only 73 um, but her, I've got an auntie and uncle that are in their late nineties that live together. They haven't had their jabs. And Steve, my friend who I go running with, he's in his fifties and he's still got a nan and she hasn't had her jab. And so I said to Steve, why don't you phone the doctors and say, you know, my, my, my nan's 99. She needs a jab. Oh no, you can't, you can't phone them because the doctors are really strict. You can't phone them. You can't ask them when it's going to be. They're really strict with you. And I was like, I'm sure they'd make an exception for a 99 or someone in their nineties, but no. Mm. I'm not. I think I would quite like the local news, the BBC Southeast, you know, they do the Hastings figures. They do all of the Southeast figures. Are we going up coronavirus or are we going down? They have little arrows. I would quite like them to do the numbers of people that have been vaccinated because I think there are pockets of the country that are being slightly overlooked. I agree with you and I think also when you see that the numbers of vaccinated people are going up it actually puts a little bit of hope in my heart and I think we all need to look at some positive rather than just constant like these. Are oh for sure no it's it's brilliant and you know I have nothing but admiration for the scientists at Oxford you know at Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccine. I think it's a brilliant, amazing thing to do to have come up with a vaccine. But I would like to know what the rollout is looking like. It's yeah. so random and we're so used to a hopeless government that we just go, okay, well, probably the Southeast is being left behind because yeah, no, we're a bit shit. <laughs> right, well, certain, certain towns, certain areas, are even 
the same towns but different doctor surgeries are getting different treatments so it's just a yeah. very very odd system that they're using i made a vietnamese pho the other day which was so hot that i would say could possibly have wiped out anything including the coronavirus a vietnamese what is it called pho pho is it pho P-H-O. i don't know what that is oh, is it my. like a curry no it's like it's like a noodle soup oh it's chicken and noodle pho how do you spell pho P H O, pho. Oh, pho. They pronounce it th. Pho. Pho. That's how you do it. Anyway, so I did. In fact, there's a shop in in London, and they're everywhere now. There's one in Brighton called Pho. Oh, yes. is there? Yeah, it's my favourite food, and I learned how to make it on my with my pressure. So what made it so hot? Was it chilies? I only put two in, but they were little bird's eye ones. They were James, bastard ones. James was like really hot and I was like well you haven't got COVID because <laughs> I'm sure it would wipe out anything <laughs> well it's taste though isn't it that you lose not um not yeah. the not the heat you'd you would still probably um uh, be able to feel the heat on your taste buds rather yeah. than you know because yeah. when you get a chili it's not a taste is it it's just bloody no. hot it is but well I because I had COVID in March as you know and I didn't lose my taste buds I ate like a beast. <laughs> wow. So what was your main um, symptom? Flu-like? High temperature and f- like flu-like symptoms, like you say. And the worst headache. It was, that was my worst. I didn't have a cough either. I just had a really terrible headache. But the weird thing was that I had an antibody test afterwards and it was positive. And then I wanted to see how long after I'd still have antibodies for it. And it was five, they, you know, what they're saying now is it's five months, but it was five months I took another antibody test and I was negative. Wow. But I wonder if you retain some of that. Well, they say, that, if... these, they say that your T cells fight disease. Yeah. So I don't know, I don't think it's just antibodies that sort it out. I think T cells do too. Anyway, on that note, I think that it's been lovely to talk to you, Maria. I was just going to say, I have a phone call at five. Come on, at five. Also, you'll edit this, presumably. No, I won't. I'll just put it on. I can't edit. No, you can't put an hour of nonsense on. It's not nonsense. People love to listen to it. It's going on, Maria, whether you like it or not. It's the best bits you need. Blimey. (laughs) Well, I'll send it to you to edit. Thank no, you so much for being my lovely guest. It's been very nice to talk to you. Say bye. goodbye to Bye, Dolly. I love you. I love you, Dolly. I'll see you soon. You need a haircut. Yes. She does. When can I book her in? As soon Speak as Speak to you along the way, darling. See you, darling. Bye-bye.